How do you get City Hall to listen to your concerns? How do you make your voice heard powerfully and effectively when you're talking to city officials? In short, how do you get local government to do what you want it to do? Let's find out. Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. This season on our show, we're asking a simple but profound question. What is civics? To us, civics is the art of being a pro-social, problem-solving contributor in a self-governing community. And I want to unpack that. Pro-social meaning it's not just about seeking your most narrow, selfish ends. Problem solving in the sense that it's not just about complaining about things and self-governing in the idea that no one's going to come in and save us and swoop in and fix things for us. We've got to solve things together. That's what it means to exercise our civic muscle. On other episodes of the show, we've looked at the work of community organizing or running for office. Well, today we want to ask this question of what does it take to get local government to do what you want? How do you move that beast and move that machine? And it's worth thinking about in the first place, that we live in a time right now where so much of our political discussion is oriented toward Washington, D.C., toward national politics. But it's in the local that issues like housing and transportation and education play out. This is where we actually do or don't make an impact that touches the texture of our everyday lives. And so today, to think about what it takes to get local government to do what you want, we want to focus on three particular strategies. Testifying in hearings, meeting with representatives, and getting a lobbyist. And we're going to unpack each of these three for you and for us the, the, as citizens. So let's start with testifying in hearings. When you think about testifying in hearings, you think, you know, you turn on the Seattle channel and you'll see things uh, in the middle of a hearing. And sometimes, I admit, it can be painful to watch this. You can see somebody at the podium just going on and droning and droning and not making any sense. Uh, and one of the things that we've got to remember is that it's just as painful for the person hearing that testimony. And so for us to think about how to do that effectively, we've got to remember three simple rules. If you're going to go to a city council hearing or to a state legislative hearing and you're going to talk about an issue that matters, you've got to have a plan in the first place. You have to make it a story and you have to practice. Now let's talk about each of these things. Having a plan. In the first place, what does it mean to have a plan and not just ramble? I think so much of the testimony that we hear, people walk up and they're full of passion, they're full of anger or hope or something about an, a particular issue, and they'll just start spilling forth. You've got to have a specific strategy of what it means to actually move people uh, in that setting. And the way to do that oftentimes is actually to tell a story, not to load people with data and facts and conceptual notions, but to actually begin with a parable, something rooted in the life of the community that people can relate to uh, sitting on the other side of the dais. And finally, practicing this. That if you just wing it up there, you're going to have trouble sometimes in the, under the lights and under the pressure of that setting. But if you actually just take a moment to think about how you're going to do this and how you're going to look at people, uh, that can make a tremendous difference. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of this to see how this plays out. Because it isn't about the rate, it's about the structure. This is not just an Amazon tax, it is a tax on these family-owned grocers. Stores like husband and wife owned West, uh, West Seattle Thriftway, Metropolitan Marcus, Wajamaya, your, your golden stars here in the community. That's because grocers are high gross sales, labor intensive, and the lowest profit of any industry, one and one half percent. So you can see the tax structure has a disproportionate hit on the grocery industry. So I would ask you to slow down and look at what the impact is beyond Amazon and to your local family-owned businesses. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Now, what was pretty interesting about that piece of testimony was that this woman came to the dais, came to the podium with a real sense of a plan. She was not just going to uh, rail in general against the head tax. Uh, this is what this debate was about, the recent uh, proposals to create uh, what some called an Amazon tax, what others called a, a general head tax. Uh, and she had a plan to frame this in terms of, as uh, she put it, local family grocers. 
uh, which was itself a story, thinking about uh, family businesses, thinking about these mom and pop businesses. You began to visualize what these places were and who these people were. She herself, as an embodiment of that, she was not a slick uh, professional uh, political type. She was just a regular person uh, speaking in a homespun way. And she clearly had come up there having thought about this and done it once or twice. Now let's look at, look at another example. We continue to see the displacement of low-income communities, communities of color, and immigrants and refugees further and further away from their jobs, services, and community institutions that help them thrive. This dynamic threatens to undermine the economic growth of the region. It will undercut our greenhouse gas reduction goals, will co make communities less resilient in the face of a disaster or tragedy. We have long believed that by capturing a public benefit from growth and reinvesting it in affordable housing through inclusionary housing programs like MHAR could slow the trends of displacement and suburbanization of poverty. By requiring developers to either build on site or pay on a fund, we begin to capture the increased value of the land and make progress towards a more equitable city. I support the MHAR residential framework and the equitable implementation throughout the city because it's an important tool in a broader comprehensive anti-displacement strategy. Thank you for your leadership in this. Now, what I like about this piece of testimony is the way that this uh, woman was able so much to capture complex ideas in a way that was very grounded, talking about housing affordability and the ways in which public benefit needed to be captured as new development is unfolding in our city. And the way that she had self-possession and was able both to read a document the, that she'd been preparing, obviously, she'd practiced, she'd had a plan, but also make eye contact uh, with the members of the city council and look at them and humanize this issue. And she herself uh, making that case in a way that was very, again, not abstract, but grounded in real experience. So you think about what it takes to actually have effective testimony. It's not rocket science, but it does take these ideas of having a plan and really thinking about how you're going to practice uh, doing this work. Well, let's go to the second strategy here of getting local government to do what you want to do, and that's just meeting with your representatives. Now, again, you think about meeting with your representatives, and actually it's relatively rare uh, that everyday citizens will uh, spend time, face time, uh, with their city council member. But it is not impossible. In fact, it is quite possible. Uh, sometimes you can do that by actually requesting a meeting and going to the office and sitting down at the table with the uh, council member or her or his staff member. Uh, other times it might be just at a public event, uh, at the opening of a park or something like that, where that council member is there and you can go up there and you can say, hey, can I have a couple of minutes of your time? Can we talk about an issue, right? And here in the work of uh, meeting with re your representatives and how to make those meetings, whether they're short or long, planned or unplanned, making them effective, we actually can take a page literally from the book from our friend and former city council member Nick Licata, who wrote this book, Becoming a Citizen Activist. And in Nick's book, uh, it's full of great lessons and uh, insights from having been on the other side, being a member of the council and being inundated with different forms of citizen action and citizen uh, pressure. But he talks about these three pieces of advice if you want to meet with a representative, an elected official of yours. Number one, be specific really have an idea of what is the problem you're wanting to solve, not just homelessness in general, but this particular rise of homelessness, homelessness in this part of town, not just uh, the need for more bicycles and, and bike lanes, but specifically how to connect the dots between these particular bike lanes and those, uh, and to be specific in naming that problem. Secondly, to know concretely what you want from government, right? Not just, I want things fixed. Sometimes you want a piece of legislation. Sometimes you want a resolution stating uh, the will of the council to apply pressure on the mayor. Sometimes you want a task force to be formed so that people can study an issue. Whatever it is that you and your fellow citizens want, uh, you've got to know that and be concrete about that when you meet with that member uh, of the council. And finally, don't accept nothing for an answer. And that may seem obvious, but it is the nature of politics and politicians to give you basically a nothing burger when you ask them for something and to say, you know, uh, I'll take that into consideration. Thank you for expressing those views. That's really important. I really see how much this matters to you. And you will feel like you've been heard in the moment, but if you've got something you want to say, you've got to say, I can't let you off the hook that easy. Are you with me or not? Will you do this or not? Will you move this or not? Not accepting nothing for an answer is a really important part uh, of the stories that Nick tells here. He talks about the ways in which um, if sometimes a politician, a, an elected member of your council, tries to give you a variation of nothing, uh, in a closed door meeting, then you've got to think about what it means actually to apply outside pressure, protest or uh, mobilizing voters, whatever it might be. And I think 
one of these, uh, any one of these uh, pieces, being specific, knowing what you want in terms of a solution and not accepting nothing, uh, each one of these is vital uh, to being effective and making good use of that time. Nick talks about in his book uh, a time when there was a proposal uh, from a previous mayor to consolidate a whole bun of, bunch of commissions in our uh, city government, uh, uh, women's commissions, uh, sexual minorities, uh, others, uh, into a single body that would be more efficient and save money, but also reduce the voice of each of these communities. And so Nick thought about this and he started hearing uh, all kinds of pressure and complaints from people as he met with them. And what resulted from that was actually he decided to hold a public hearing to make those voices amplified. And when those voices were amplified, and this goes back to our first strategy of testifying uh, in public, uh, he was able to create enough general pressure so that, pro that proposal was abandoned. So think hard about how you want to spend time with that re representative. Our third and final strategy here is this, get a lobbyist. Now, that may seem counterintuitive, right? You might think, well, to go to City Hall or to go to a Capitol, I got to be this person who's a high-powered, well-heeled lobbyist who works for a big corporation or for uh, some powerful, powerful group. But the reality is that every one of us as citizens can have a lobbyist. And there are so many organizations out there uh, that have been citizens' lobbies. We look today in our politics at groups like Sierra Club or Moms Demand Action or the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. But think about, over the decades, groups like Common Cause, uh, which organized and originated as a citizen's lobby, or Public Citizen, which Ralph Nader in the 1960s and 70s founded, again, to be a people's lobby, to pressure and to create countervailing power against the lobbies that big corporations and big interests had. There is a long history of citizens' lobbyists. And another way to think about them is not the word lobby and lobbyist, which maybe feels tainted to a lot of us everyday folks, but ra rather than think about organized interests, that we create collective interests that have a voice, that have somebody who can work the inside game for us. That in the end is what a lobbyist is, someone who can communicate, who has relationships in the building, who can actually move people in different ways and to think about how you actually uh, affect things. Having that voice, uh, who can represent you uh, in the halls of city government, but also have the relationships within government, both with our electeds and with key staff and appointed officials, is key to what it means to get a lobbyist. Well, all this work of getting local government to do what you want plays out in so many different issues today, right now, in our city. And we want to spend some time, actually, now, looking at a particular issue uh, and one of the ways in which one of our city council members has been hearing uh, from citizens about getting local government to do what you want. I'm Teresa Mosqueda, Seattle City Council's newest member. I represent the entire city at large. The most important way for us to get messages through to elected officials, whether at the state level, the national level, or here at City Council, is to tell your story. I was with a family that was paying me bare minimum. I didn't have any benefits. I didn't have any paid time off. I didn't have any sick leave or anything like that. Not really getting anything. Being able to hear the stories from people who have been impacted, um, by, you know, whether, you know, poor working conditions or, you know, not making enough money, whatever it is, uh, has really been one of the most powerful tools that we have. My name is Rachel Lauder. I'm the Executive Director of Working Washington and the Fair Work Center. So, Working Washington has a long history of successful workers' rights campaigns in Seattle and Washington. Um, some of that you may have heard of include the Fight for 15. Sort of using new media to get our message across. So, but if you're an individual citizen, I, you know, I always think being concise, being clear, being respectful of the electeds and the, you know, the various power brokers is always going to be the most effective way to get your message across. Do your research, build your relationships, build your coalitions. Can you agree with that? We would definitely rely on sort of the tradition of fun and interesting and creative actions. So a good example is that when Councilmember Mosqueda introduced the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, before it we held a press conference where we built these and painted these doors and paper and had domestic workers run through the doors and, and rip the paper and sort of break down the doors. As nannies, as house cleaners, as caretakers, um, the work of domestic workers makes this city work. Many of the protections that we put into place for most workers, like 
workers' compensation, disability insurance, health insurance are not being realized by some of our most vulnerable workers. That to me called out the, the injustice of their current system. Being uh, strategic about how you set up a meeting with somebody, sometimes it requires getting introduced to a staff member in order to set up a meeting, but you know, getting on somebody's calendar and sitting down and saying, we'd really like you to consider introducing this bill. You have to make the, a direct ask. I mean, I think people are sometimes nervous about that piece. The best way to get my attention is to send us messages, postcards, letters, calls, and also ask us to come to your community. You have to stand up for yourself. I now, as an elected official, want to hear who you are, who you represent, what the issue is, and what the potential solution is. But I also want to be able to talk about where I'm coming from. And you, as an advocate, then can hear where there might be common ground, if there's questions or concerns, what those issues are, so that you can leave the room and then better organized to come back and address those issues. Think about it, a sort of long game of how you build more and more grassroots support, more and more people getting behind it, so that in some ways it almost feels inevitable, right? That you can come back to the power broker, the legislator, in a few months and say, this is what people want, and like, this is the way of the future, so you should get behind it. We deserve respect! Now to talk with us more about how to get local government to do what you want, we're joined now by Clara Cantor, who's a community organizer at Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And Clara, welcome. Thank you. Um, so Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, tell, tell us what you all do and what, what do you mean by Neighborhood Greenways? So we're a grassroots-based organization. Um, we have a coalition of 20 different neighborhood groups spread all across the city that are all completely volunteer-led and run. Um, and we empower people to make change in their neighborhoods um, for safe streets, to make their neighborhoods great places to walk, bike, and live. Hmm. And so when you say greenways, uh, uh, that you typically mean streets that are, that are off the arterials, um, and, and the greenness of the greenways is not necessarily about trees or beautification, but it is about whether they are walk and bike friendly. Exactly. So our name came from our original project, which was um, convincing the city of Seattle that neighborhood greenways were a viable option for getting around the city. Um, we did that through a number of um, tactics, through campaigns for a number of years, and succeeded. And now you see greenways all over Seattle. Um, at that point, we had our name, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, uh, and we went to our neighborhood groups and said, what else do we need? What should we work on next? And Everyone had separate projects that they were working on in their neighborhoods, and we decided that, you know, we need neighborhood greenways, but we also need sidewalks, and we need protected bike lanes, and we need other types of infrastructure and improvements. And so we started working on those as well. So our name is a little bit deceptive and limiting, but we do work on a lot of other issues. So when you say rewinding there, that um, early on you, you, you pushed for Seattle greenways and, and you succeeded, um, A, what does that mean you succeeded? And B, what did it take to succeed? Like what, what had to happen there um, from an organizing and a, a, a applying pressure on city government standpoint? Um, so when I say we succeeded, it means that the city planners include neighborhood greenways as part of their master plans for the city. Hmm. Um, so there's a, a bicycle master plan, for example, and a pedestrian master plan, transit master plans. Um, and their long-term looks at um, what we want the city to look like in 10, 20 years. Um, and so having the city include neighborhood greenways as part of that master plan is a success. And, um, and so you all in this great volunteer-led uh, grassroots way um, have learned a thing or two about how to apply pressure on, um, on different parts of city government. What are some of the top takeaways that you all have learned from, from all this work of, uh, of organizing? Well, um, I'd say first and foremost that our city officials and transportation Department of Transportation staff and our city council, they're all people. And, you know, they all come with their own sets of experiences, their own neighborhoods that they know a lot about, their own um, professional histories. And so, one, um, I think there's a level of intimidation there that a lot of people think that our government is is very removed from we, the regular citizenry, um, and that's just not the case. And um, so, relationship 
building and, and Absolutely just Absolutely relationship building and yeah. humanizing. Um, but also recognizing that they are busy and they, they work on a lot of different issues in a lot of different neighborhoods and recognizing that you are probably more of an expert on the user experience of that intersection in front of your house than anyone in the Seattle Department of Transportation. Mm. Um, and that that's a valuable perspective for them to hear. Um, and having the confidence to be able to speak to that is really important. So again, there are plenty of viewers out there who, who, who know what you're talking about, who've done what you're talking about, and then there are plenty of others who are like, what do you mean they will hear me? Like in the first place, the obstacle of how do I get someone from SDOT or any part of government to hear me? Um, and so what have you learned there just about the basics of how to get heard, whether in uh, council hearings or, or, or in closed door meetings? Well, what I like to tell people is that it's really about storytelling. Um, you know, if you can tell a personal story about your experience um, in traveling through your neighborhood in getting to the places that you need to go, that's incredibly powerful. And, you know, as much as we can use data and statistics and, um, you know, cite a whole bunch of different research that we've done, we've done and that, is, that has its place also. Um, what's really going to get people to care about what you're talking about is a personal story. Mm. Now, um, as we sit here, um, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways has had a, a, a recent win um, getting the city council to unanimously uh, approve a resolution um, that you all have been organizing, pushing on. Tell us a bit about that and um, what it does and why it came to be and, and again, what it took um, from a citizen action standpoint to, to make that happen. Yeah, so this is something that we're very excited about. Um, it's a big win for us, but it's also just a step on a much larger campaign. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that we've been working on for years now. Um, it's um, basically the resolution sets a timeline for the Seattle Department of Transportation to complete what we call the basic bike network, which is a connected network of safe routes for people to bike on into and through and out of downtown Seattle. Um, what exists right now is that we have a lot of really great infrastructure for people biking, um, but none of it connects. And so you're biking along this really great, really safe, comfortable route, and all of a sudden it'll just end. And you'll be left out in the middle of a really dangerous intersection with trucks and buses and fast moving vehicles, and it's terrifying. Um, so the idea behind this this map that we've drawn up is that we want to draw lines that connect all of those pieces of infrastructure to each other and create routes that people can use and feel comfortable and safe on the entire route. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that we've been working on for a number of years. Um, and it has had several delays and timelines over the years. Um, things have been pushed back. The political will hasn't necessarily been there. Um, and so, this is, this is really encouraging for us to have, uh, one, the, the city council come together and unanimously say this is important to us and this is a priority and we want this to be built now. And so how, how did you get there? Uh, again, I want to pa paint a picture for our viewers of how your volunteer members actually, what do they do to make this happen? So this has been a lot of work by a lot of people. Um, a lot of neighborhood organizing from the various groups that will be connected to this network. Um, in May, we had uh, we hosted Seattle's first people protected bike lane, which was right in front of City Hall. Um, we had 50 people standing out in the middle of the street. We had coned off of a, off a lane, waving streamers and giving high fives. And was this sort of a direct action, or did you get permission or permits to, to do this? This was not a permanent action. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay good. All right. So, all right, that's that's part of the the, the, yeah. the playbook. Sometimes it <clears throat> involves being a little bit creative yeah. and helping people to um, see what's possible in our streets. So you stage this in front of City Hall. Um, yes. Uh, um, what other kinds of mobilizations? Rally. Yeah. We had a, a lot of different um, people sending in emails and letters to elected officials and to um, SDOT staff voicing their opinions. We had people showing up at city council hearings and making public comments, standing in the back with signs. Um, now, again, this is an all volunteer um, organization. Yeah. So as you were doing this, some of your volunteers might be very experienced at this kind of work and mm -hmm. others might not. Did you all have a playbook or a common um, you know, set of guidelines for how to talk to your city council member, how to show up at a hearing, how to 
try to you know, uh, uh, communicate this message via phone call or whatever it might be? We don't necessarily have a playbook, but one of the greatest strengths of our organization is that we have a, we're set up in such a way that we all learn from each other mm. every single time we do anything. Mm. Um, you know, and if you're showing up at a city council meeting, for example, and you've never been there before, and you're figuring out how to find the room, and you don't really know what's going on, you have a whole group of people standing next to you who can say, hey, this is your first time. You know, I've been here before. Let me yeah, tell you how this goes. Yeah. Let, me, let me help you with your story, um, with what you're going to say when you get up there to the microphone, because it can be very nerve wracking. Um, and that's incredibly helpful. It was incredibly helpful for me when I first, uh, when I first started a few months ago um, to have that that resource for me. Well, that idea of citizens helping citizens mm -hmm. and uh, bringing each other along in that spirit of, of mutual aid is, uh, I mean, it sounds like the spirit of your organization, but it's also a great set of strategies for people outside to think about how to get uh, get stuff done. So Absolutely. to find out more about uh, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, it's just, um, the website is? SeattleGreenways.org. SeattleGreenways.org, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. You're very welcome. Uh, my guest has been Clara Cantor. She's an organizer at Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and you can find out more, as we said, at seattlegreenways.org. So in today's episode, we've been talking about how to get local government to do what you want. And we've been focusing on three core strategies. First, testifying in hearings, making your voice heard in a way that requires you to actually practice, to root it in story, and to really have a plan about how you're going to use that time in front of uh, your elected officials. Secondly, meeting with representatives, whether formally or in informally, and that means really making sure that you are specific about the problem you want to solve, you're concrete about what it is you want government to do, and you're relentless in not letting your elected officials off the hook and giving you vague, uh, noncommittal answers. And finally, thinking about lobbying and getting a lobbyist, which again, is not about hiring the well-heeled, but is about recognizing that we the people have citizens' lobbies out there and we can organize them to get their voices and our voices heard inside the halls of power. But above all, literally, is the idea that we have to, as citizens of this city, vote. To vote is to get all of our elected officials to pay attention and to get government to do what we want. Elected officials are in many ways leaders, but they are also exquisitely attuned followers and they will follow the vote and see who shows up to vote. So make sure you do. Well, in every episode, we love to take your questions and comments uh, that come in via social media. And we've got a really good one here today. This one comes from Catherine on Facebook. And it says, when so much of working to make systematic change is a long game, what, can, what, ways, what are some ways we can measure and reflect on our short-term impact? Well, we've actually been hearing about that throughout this episode. Uh, our friend from Seattle Neighborhood Greenways was talking about how so much of this work is about having a stepwise plan, that they recently as an organization had this big win where the city council unanimously passed a resolution uh, calling for the stitching together of bike lanes across the city. But remember, that resolution is non-binding. There are other steps that have to go from there. And so you've got to be thinking about how can you chunk the work into a set of small wins that can build upon each other. This is the way we've got to think about it, to not feel apathetic, hopeless, or overwhelmed. Well, we want to hear from you in the future with all kinds of questions and thoughts, so please contact us through all these different channels on social media, our email address and our website, and of course our hashtag always, hashtag CitizenUTV. Uh, well, that wraps this episode of Citizen University TV. We hope you've learned something about how to get local government to do what you want, and we hope you'll think more broadly about how to exercise your voice and your power as citizens. I'm Eric Liu. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.